Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are high on the frozen slopes of a great mountain, terrified and caught in a blizzard, while the thing for which you've been hunting has suddenly become the hunter. And if it finds you, then for you and your companion, there can be no escape. So listen now as Escape brings you Anthony Ellis' exciting story, The Abominable Snowman. bit of luck was when we hired our shepherd guide, Nasang. That was in Darjeeling. When I told Nasang what we were after, he hesitated for a moment. And then he said, The Sabs have not come to climb Shomolongma? Oh, no. We're a little late for that. It's already been done. The other two Sabs and myself are here for the reason I told you. Metokangni? That's right. The Sabs always hire me to climb the mountain with them. But never this. Are you afraid of them? I have seen one. You've seen one? Yes, many of us have seen them. Uh, wait a minute. Alan. Yeah. What's that? I'm interviewing a Sherpa in here. He says he's seen one of the things. Hey? Yeah. That's right. Uh, we'll have to get some tobacco. Yeah. All right, come on in. I think this is our man. All right. Nasang. This is Mr. Ferris. Sir? Hello, Nassan. Nassan was telling me about what he'd seen. Go ahead, Nassan. It has a face that is evil. And when it saw me, it uttered a strange cry and bounded away. Sometimes leaping, sometimes running with great stride. It was dusk. And after a moment, I lost sight of it in the snow. Where were you? With the French expedition. It was at 19,000 feet on Shomolungma. How far were you from it? 30 feet, uh, perhaps 35. You are sure it wasn't an ape? I am sure. There is no ape in Himalaya to make such a track. What about bears? This too I have been asked. But does a bear walk always upon its hind legs? Well, that's enough for me. Alan? Yeah, he'll do. Yeah. But if you want the job, Nassan, you're hired. You are going to try to capture a yeti? Yes. It will be a difficult thing. But I will serve with you. Yeti, wild man, metal kong me. Abominable snowman. That's the name the natives had for the things, and Alan Ferris, Frank Davis, and I were going to try to get one. We'd all done some climbing, but climbing was secondary here. Expeditions since the beginning of the 20th century had heard of the abominable snowman, observed their tracks, and one or two white men claimed to have seen them. Great ape, bear, monkey, wild men. We didn't know. But we were going to find out. Four weeks later, we were in the Rongbuk Valley for our interview at the monastery with the Lama. The journey from our base had been uneventful. The weather was good and our spirits were high. From the Lama's window, we could see the great peak of Everest in the distance. Why, gentlemen, do you desire to capture Mithokangi? 
Because, sir, we believe it will be an invaluable aid in our prehistoric research. That is, if these things are in any way human. And for this reason, then, you have formed the expedition? Yes. You are all familiar with climbing? Yes, we are. You would need to be. The Yeti move at high places. Dangerous places, so my people tell me. Also, the monsoons are arriving in a short time. I understand that. Then do we have your permission to investigate in the valley and beyond? You have my permission. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. There is one point, however. I must request that no wild animal or being in this valley be shocked. Our religion does not allow it. We'll respect your wishes, sir. Now, may I ask you one more thing? Of course, my son. Do you believe in the existence of Metokongli? I myself have never seen them, but I know that they live here, above the valley, on the goddess mother of the world. It is also true that at least five, and possibly more, inhabit the upper Rongbuk and its glacier. Thank you. Do you have porters? Our guide, Masang, is hiring them now. Yeah. I trust that he meets with good fortune. The old man, with great dignity, bowed slightly to us and we were dismissed. But I thought I saw the shadow of a smile on his lips as he turned away. And it wasn't long before I found out why. Nasang returned to us in our quarters and his face warned of bad news. Sir, I am unable to hire any porters. But why not? They know the purpose of the expedition. They will not go. Why? They are afraid. Of the snowmen? Yes. They live in peace with them. They wish no trouble. They are afraid. Well, all right. It'll be rough, but we can't waste time talking them into it. The monsoons will be coming in a couple of weeks. It's not the same as climbing, Everest. We'll travel light, just the four of us, set up a base and start hunting. All right with you, fellows? Yeah, sure. Now, son? I will go with you. I am not afraid. Good. Well, let's take a look at the map. Now, we'll each carry a capacity load. We should be able to make this point below the glacier in two days. That's 16,000 feet. Mm. And if our abominable snowmen are in the vicinity, we've got two weeks to find them. When do we start? Tomorrow. Good. Well, that's it. Um, Paul? Yes, Frank? Uh, one thing. What do the natives mean when they say they don't want any trouble with the thing? Uh, superstition, probably. Oh, no, sir. It is not superstition. It is because the Yeti are cannibals. That is why the porters are afraid. The weather turned ugly the day we left the village. A cold Tibetan wind blew down from the west, and with our heavy packs it took us much longer than we thought to arrive at the point just below the Rongbuk Glacier. We set up our camp and made ourselves as comfortable as we could. The next morning wasn't so bad. There was a heavy overcast, a promise of snow, and the peak of Everest looming over us was shrouded in clouds. The four of us sat in the tent looking at our charts and drinking hot tea. Uh, I figured it'd be easiest if we started at the East Glacier. It's only about three miles from here, and with the weather as stinking as it is, we won't run too much of a risk. What do you think, Paul? Well, that sounds all right. What do you say we split up? Uh, you and Masang, Alan and me. We'll work up on either side of the ridge, here. And if we spot any tracks, fire two shots. Hmm? Yeah, good enough. Now, the big thing, though, no matter what, don't shoot at the thing if you do see it. Okay? Okay. All right. If we lose touch with each other, we'll meet back here at five. All right, let's get going We'd left the base at six that morning, and the going was rough. 
Alan was pretty well shot by the time we got to the 17,000 foot mark. He was having a tough time breathing. And the wind had come up again. And with it, a fine powdery snow that blinded and choked us. Hey, I, I, I gotta take five. All right. Here, move over here. Might cut some of the wind. Oh. Oh. Oh, that's better. Well, we might as well start back for the base. We couldn't see anything in this anyhow. You know, right now, I don't care whether we do or not. Now, this is good weather. Wait until the monsoon starts. No, no, not me. Oh, I'm cold. I've never been so cold in all my life. We stayed in the half shelter of an overhang for ten minutes. The wind was quieter and the snow had lit up. I noticed that the tracks we'd made coming into the shelter were gone now. But we didn't have any worry finding our way back. I figured that Frank and Nassang had met pretty much the same thing on their side of the ridge, and we'd meet them at the base. So Alan and I picked ourselves up and started off. Boy, I, I thought I was in pretty good shape, but up here, boy, I'm nothing. Oh, Paul, I'm tired again. We'll just take it easy going down. You haven't got frostbite, have you? No. No, not yet, but... What? The left there. Yeah. They're, they're not our tracks, are they? Not unless you took your boots off on the way up. Must have just passed by. It must have seen us. Yeah. Come on. We were looking at a set of tracks newly made in the fresh snow. And they'd passed so close to our shelter that the thing must have known we were there. They weren't the tracks of a bear or an ape, but more like a splay-footed naked foot. The tracks of the abominable snowman. We will return to escape in just a moment, but first... 30 million school children make their way back to class this year. There are just 10 million too many for existing school facilities. Contact Better Schools to West 45th Street, New York 19 for information on ending this menace to America's educational standards. And now, back to Escape. began to follow the tracks, and for a while, perhaps 150 yards, it was easy. And then the thing made a leftward traverse down a deep slope. We could see the prince clearly, angling with a sidestep, as sure-footed as a mountain goat, except that it was walking on two legs. This way, Paul. Take it easy, Al. Get, getting safer. Boy, that thing sure can climb. Hold up. Allah. Oh. And he dropped out of sight over the lip of the crevasse. We weren't roped together. I got as close as I dared to the edge. The loose snow crumbled away from my outstretched body. And I looked down into the blue-black darkness below, falling away into nothingness. He was gone. Finished. All I could think of was the noise he'd made when he went over. Surprised, angry, then silent. The crevasse might have been 500 feet or 5,000. Snow started to fall again. Big flakes this time and wet. I stood up. And across the gap 20 feet away, I saw the tracks of the thing continuing on and away until they became lost in the blank whiteness of the glacier. It had jumped and landed still upright on the opposite side. 
I went back to the base. And an hour later, Frank and the song returned. I told them. And we were quiet for a long time. Then... Paul, are we going out again tomorrow? Why not? I just wanted to. We should go back. Is this an omen? I tell you, he was going too fast. He didn't have a chance to see the crevasse. That's not an omen. It's bad sense. Mr. Kong, we cannot be caught. We'll catch him. Oh, but there are only three of us if we had a few more men. I tell you, the thing was so close that we'd, if we'd looked up at the right time, we'd have seen it. You think I'm going to give up now? Next time we'll get it. There was no chance to get out and out. No. You think if we went back... We'd... Listen, you think I don't want to? He's gone. I tried, but he's gone. Okay. Oh, okay. Wish that wind had let up. Maybe by morning. We'll try again tomorrow. It was cold that night, and somehow colder because Alan was gone. I heard Frank tossing around, and I knew he was thinking about a body broken and lonely, lost somewhere in a deep and dark place. In the morning, the three of us packed our gear, camera, food. It was a light pack. And we started up again. This time to a crest above the ridge. It was tougher than it looked, and we weren't even halfway up before we had to rest. And as I looked to the west, I saw clouds boiling up. Not white, but somber, threatening. And below, the valley looked grim, ugly gray. And then the sun was gone. And we kept on going up. And then I had a strange feeling. It was nothing I could see, nothing I could hear, only a sensation of being watched, followed. Wait a minute. See something? No. I, I have felt it too sad. Something I, following us? Yes. It is made to come me. How do you know? It can be nothing else. At this height, there is nothing else that lives. Maybe it's curious. No, don't turn around, Frank. Listen. When we get up to the crest, you two flop down. Stay in sight of the slope here. What are you going to do? Move around the hump and watch. If it thinks we're all together, it may come close enough to give us a chance to get it. You better watch your step. It looks nasty. I will. Now, come on. It took us another 15 minutes to get up to the crest, and then Frank and Nassong hunched down to rest. They were in clear view of the slope we just descended. I moved back out of sight and made my way toward the hump, which backed a long shelf on the north side of the crest. In a couple of minutes, I lost sight of them and of the slope. The wind had increased and the clouds had spread now to become an iron-gray canopy over the mountain. It was getting colder again. I don't think it took over five minutes to reach my lookout point. And when I did, I had a perfect view of the ground we'd covered. There was nothing there. The men were out of sight. And I waited. A minute... Two. There was nothing. Until... It came, carried on the wind, a cry, and then shot. I scrambled back to where I'd left them. And when I got there... When I got there... Frank was lying on his back. And I couldn't look at what was left of his face. There were terrible deep rents in his clothing, and he was dead. The song lay huddled a few feet beyond, a gun in his hand. Son. Yeah. What is it? What? Metro Kangmi. He came from behind us. Before I could throw the gun. And killed. Then it sprang at me. It is strong, time for the strength of ten men. All right. All right, can you sit up? My leg. It struck at me. My leg 
broken. I shot at it, but I missed. It jumped away and was gone. Okay. We'll have to figure out a way to get you down. We were four hours from camp, and with Nassan practically helpless, it could well be four days or never. I buried Frank where he was lying, then began to work down the slope. The song was in great pain. He half slid and crawled as best he could. That part of it wasn't too bad. Then we were at the bottom and there was a ledge to climb. It took well over two hours to do that. And we still had three miles of difficult terrain to cover. The stops became more frequent. Dad, leave me here. Go back. No. My leg is frozen. There is no feeling anymore. I shall not live much longer. Don't be a fool. After a rest, you'll be able to go on. Soon the night comes. If we are both caught here, we both die. There will be snow, much snow. Leave me. No, we're going back together. Please, let me sleep. Let me sleep here. I cannot go on. You've got to, Nassar. No, no more. The ridge is only about a half mile. From there, it won't be too bad. No, no, let me stay. Nassan. Let me sleep. No. No, come on, Nassan. Come on, you're not going to sleep. Nassan. You'll be all right. Behind you, sir. I turned, and for an instant I saw it outlined against the snow, crouching of medium height. It was covered with thick hair. The face was reddish and bare. A semi-human face. And it was not an ape. The thing made a tremendous leap and was gone, but I hit it. I knew I hit it. Mr. Conley, is it was he? Did you kill it? No, I don't think so. Then it will be back. It has tasted blood. You must leave me. No, get up. Get up. Come on. Let's go. No song. No song. I am very sorry, sir. Will you ask the lover to make a prayer for me? Sure. Sure I will, Miss Angler. Give my pay to my wife in their hearing. I'm sorry, sir. I die. The song? The song? darkness came, and with its shadows and the snow, every hillock, mound, became the thing, motionless, waiting. In my mind, I kept seeing it, its long arms, powerful, and the dreadful claws it must have possessed. I carried my gun in my gloved hand, but I knew that I couldn't fire it unless I was barehanded, and that meant my hand would freeze to the gun. And then suddenly I felt myself slipping. It was a short incline, but when I reached the bottom, the gun was gone. I'd lost it. I've got to find it. I've got to find it. And I saw a glint of metal in the snow ten feet away. And at the same time, above me at the top of the bank, the thing... It stood swaying a little, looking down at me. I moved slowly, slowly, inched my way toward the gun. And as I drew closer, I kept my eyes looking up. But it didn't move, only stared down at me. And I thought I saw its little eyes glittering. And I thought, if the gun's frozen now, if it's frozen, it doesn't fire. And I was nearer to it, near enough to take off my glove. But that moment in which I'd have to bend to pick it up, that's when it would leap down at me, tear my throat out, tear and... I had the gun and I pulled the trigger. <laughs> and it lay there, strange and terrifying, its blood staining the snow. 
Look at me. Looked at me. Until the sound died away. It was dead. But the eyes kept on staring. It must have been the shots that loosened the snow and ice on the ridge above. I heard the sound, and I ran. Ran! It passed me and swept on down toward the valley, the thunder of it dying in the distance. And when I went back, there was nothing there. It was buried somewhere under tons of snow. I made my way back to the wrong book village. I don't remember how. I didn't remember anything for two weeks after. But I'm alive. And I'm not going back there again. That's all I know. Or want to know. About the abominable snowmen. Escape has brought you The Abominable Snowman, written and directed by Anthony Ellis, starring William Conrad as Lane. Featured in the cast were Anthony Barrett, Hi Aberback, Jack Crucian, and Edgar Barrier. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week... passenger aboard a submarine making its last peaceful voyage across the sea. While unknown to you, the captain has a plan which, if it succeeds, will mean for you and the entire crew a fate from which there can be no escape. So listen next week when escape will bring you Marion Mosner... And Francis Rosenwald's exciting story, The Log. You're headed in the right direction. The station is right. The network is right, too. Check all timepieces, and then check your local radio schedule. Let's have no slip-ups. Everybody wants to hear the Jack Benny Show right from the beginning, when it returns to CBS Radio. To... This is Roy Rowan speaking. is the CBS Radio Network.
It can drive a man inside so deep the spring can't touch him to the vanishing point. Entry 1. Today is February 7. The first of the mutilations occurred in our district a month ago. January 4th was the exact date, I believe. The victim was a child who lives just at the end of the street, a few houses distant. We call her Android because her name is Andrea and she often carries a ray gun when playing in our yard at least. I must say, I don't particularly like the child. She manages to cause trouble at every opportunity yet seems to escape blame. I've seen her throw a half-eaten apple to the ground and then allow another child to take the blame for the litter. From my window, I've seen this. So when we heard her screams coming across the lots that evening, we thought she was being punished for some misdemeanor. But the next morning, of course, we learned this wasn't the case. They say she was attacked by a man while playing in the snow. Since it's dark by five o'clock these days, I don't know why her mother allowed her to be on the street. Police tried all the houses in the vicinity seeking witnesses. They came here, but of course we'd seen nothing. Entry 2, February 10. The snow is the worst I've experienced. All motion is just about prohibited. The streets are impossible. Many vehicles have been buried or abandoned. The authorities were simply unprepared for all this. How many snow machines do they have? Two, perhaps three. The plow seldom makes it this far, although sometimes I see it up on the hill, the orange light flashing in the darkness. Today, the temperature hasn't risen above freezing, and I fear the plumbing will go at any time. Two or three of the trees in the orchard out back have been split by the ice. Mind you, the trees do look beautiful in the sunlight. Strings of icicles hang from every branch, some more than a meter long. So the whole orchard shines and sparkles like a fairy land. My son is fascinated by it all. He spends most of his day with his mouth on the glass, watching the world in the snow. What else can he do? He's too young to go out and play. Last night I saw three policemen travel the street by foot. A weary task it must have been for them too. The snow was falling heavily. They wore heavy parkas with large furry hoods. It was impossible to see their faces. They carried spotlights. One had a rifle. They still have no clue as to who is responsible. Some say that a madman is on the loose. Oh, come on. But how could that be? Oh. None of the victims have described such a man. Christ. Of course, they're only children. And... What? Hi. Did you go out last night? I thought you were asleep. I was. Where'd you go? Around the corner. I felt like a beer. The community center? Mm. 
many people there? No. Music? One fellow played the piano, but it was pretty dead. I hope you remembered to lock the doors. Don't worry. Well, I do. Oh, I wish we could get out. You know, as a, as a family. I have to wait until the snow goes. Hmm. Responsible. Some say that a madman is on the loose. But how could that be? None of the victims have described such a man. Of course, there's panic. Parents have demanded that the schools be shut down, that soldiers should patrol the district day and night. Well, it's coming to that. Snow and ice melt one day only to return the next worse than ever. So the schools are closed half the time anyway. Food. We all have food. Things aren't that bad. Entry 4, February 14. I'm not the only one who sits looking into the night. You see few people on the streets these days. They spend most of their time at the window, watching the snow, waiting for news. Fear is everywhere. The mutilations have spread and there's hardly a family who has escaped so far. Children have been attacked in their beds, so it seems you don't have to go outside. The molester moves as silently and as easily as a virus. It's incredible that no clues as to the identity of the attacker have been found. If disease has a motive, then that motive must be our motive. Entry 6, February 17. My wife's a beautiful woman. I remember when I first met her. She was coming down the lane. I was at the bottom. I had a caterpillar on the back of my hand. I watched her approach, thinking, there is the most beautiful girl I have ever seen. Which I know sounds silly, because she wasn't any more than 14 at the time. And it was a summer afternoon. But she was beautiful. When she was about to pass, I held out my hand, saying as I did, Do you want a caterpillar? She didn't answer, but peered very seriously at it. Then she held up the back of her hand, allowing it to cross our fingers. Six years later, we were married. I don't recall what happened to the caterpillar. I see her now. She's wearing an old coat she found in her mother's chest. She's embroidered a rainbow and stitched it beneath the pocket. She wouldn't be wearing the coat if it was warmer. It hasn't been easy for her these past few weeks. She watches our son constantly. He's on the kitchen floor playing with his digging machine. He wants to go outside, but of course it's impossible. Look at him. His brow is like his mother's. The resemblance is all hers. He's not as aggressive as he used to be. The long confinement has made... What are you taping? Made... Uh, a story. Oh, I thought maybe you were keeping a diary. No. No more of that. I know it makes you jealous. I don't do that. <laughs> so you're dictating a story? Uh-huh. On cassette? Mm. 
You've never done that before. A new approach. I mean anything to break that block. Is it working? We'll see. Entry 7, February 20. Hear that? Soldiers have arrived. Although you never see them. Only their machines. A tank-like contraption has been assigned to our street. And we hear it groaning past a couple of times. It cuts through the snow with ease. Although it damaged some cars which were buried further up. And there was some shooting last night. Yet nothing was reported on the radio. Listen. A woman tried to kill herself last night. She lives across the street. And was once extremely rude to my son. He was carrying her kitten home with him, not knowing any better. However, she has agonies of her own now. Two of her children were mutilated, one of them terrifyingly so. His mouth was sewn shut with wire as he slept, and, hotter still, healed in a most peculiar way. That is, the lips grew together, sealing his mouth. So now he has to be fed intravenously. I think she put her head in the oven. I know they have a gas line. Food is getting scarcer. Though things aren't serious. Communication is the main problem. My dinner is on the floor now. Near the door. Look at it. Beans. We have tins, but no bread. yourself? It's nothing. How could you do that? It's nothing, I said. I'm sorry. You don't look well. Those rings around your eyes? You mean bags. I haven't been sleeping. I know. If we could just get out. Uh, we're low on food. How low? Low. Hmm. How's your story going? I'm not sure. What's it about? These days, we're in front of us for a fantastic fiction. I can hear you talking sometimes. Hmm? Uh, just a ramble. <laughs> it makes me think I'm married to a madman. Oh. And we'll all be mad if this weather doesn't improve soon. Sending in these tapes. I want to go sleep. You uh, don't know who she is? This type of case, they what never say. Could I do? He mm. shouldn't have I'll been tell there. you. The attorney general I, wants some answers. With blood on my mittens. This is all we shouldn't got. Shouldn't have been there either. I mean, that last bit sounded like a confession. Play it again. Spoke to him, but all he said back was. I want to go sleep. 
What could I do? He shouldn't have been there. And I, with blood on my mittens, shouldn't have been there either. Well, maybe. Sounds like a sadist. Yeah. But maybe it's all fantasy. Although he's got some very good inside info. Well, security hasn't been all that tight. No? Look, you just can't keep the lid on situations like this. I talked with Dr. Ling. Now, he listens to the tapes. He thinks the man is definitely messianic. But that doesn't mean he's the one we're looking for. God, this weather pisses me off. I hate snow. Take the day off and go skiing. Me? I don't ski. I've just been hunting. Get anything? No. What happened to your throat? Um, an accident. Yeah? I've got to make some phone calls. Check some of these details. Mm-hmm. Hear the newscast this morning? There was a newscast. Mm. All I ever hear is that funereal music. Some children were found with teeth marks on their faces. Jesus. Could be a dog. Dog? Don't think about it. It's never anyone over 13. Well, don't think about it. I think I'll do some sewing. What have you been doing? Not much. Weren't you fooling around with a telescope? I was. See anything? Not much. Stars. Lots of stars. If only I had more magnification. as if the army's behind it all. Oh, well, which is garbage. I mean, we can forget about that possibility. Colonel Angst is a good friend of mine. snowing, so I thought I would step out into the yard and get some fresh air, no matter how cold it was. I did, and immediately sank up to the waist in snow. It felt good, though. I struggled away from the back porch as far as the first apple trees. They look spectacular. The icicles becoming crystals in the light from the street. So I felt I had to progress further into this fairyland, as my son calls it. I looked up and saw the blue ghost swooping over the rooftops towards the trees. It didn't occur to me that I'd violated the law by being in my own yard. I watched in fascination the beautiful prismatic effect of the blue ray as it shone through the icicles. Believe me, it was incredible. 
the shooting was not. A machine gun or cannon. The helicopter wheeled backwards and forwards over the trees like a dragon, and its fire shattered the ice. The downdraft from the rotor caused the snow to whirl up. It was so cold it burned my face. But if it hadn't been for the storm caused by all this, I don't think I would have escaped. We expected them to land and investigate the house. But they didn't. Entry 13. I don't know what day it is. Don't even know the date. We had a visit from a clergyman this afternoon. Said he was from a church in the district. I forget what sect. The authorities, he said, had given him permission to visit people in the district and give them consolation or whatever. Since he was the only visitor we'd had in two months, we admitted we needed consolation. Odd fellow. Carried a machine pistol. Said he had a permit. You know the times in which we live, he said. He was very interested in our little boy and remarked that he was the only child he'd seen all day. All others were in hospital. We conceded our good fortune. Our son growled at the clergyman, doing his Mr. Lion routine. And we got embarrassed, since he wouldn't stop it. It was strange to see him so aggressive again, especially in such venerable company. After a short prayer, the clergyman took some red dye and sprinkled it on the crossbeam above the door. He said blood was the real sacrament, but as non-believers, he couldn't expect us. What? I saw Android's mother this morning. She said the hospital is packed. They can't take any more children. They've moved out a lot of terminal patients and older people, but there just isn't enough room. Our neighbors resent us. If you mean that bitch across the street. No, no, no. More than her. Our son hasn't been stricken, so... So they wonder why. Do you? Entry 15. The radio says the thaw is starting. Perhaps it is. As a raver. I can see the snow on the trees and... Some of it is dripping. That's not true. I love it. No mutilations have been reported for five days. Sling have any theories on that? Well, I'll have to ask him. There were no children left to mutilate. The authorities interpret this as the beginning of the end. So, what now? Guess we wait. Our plumbing hasn't failed. I'm surprised. <laughs> Entry 18. I've just taken a powerful drug. Otherwise, I couldn't repeat this. The thaw is occurring. I can see patches of pavement. The drains are full of running water. I was looking at the hill through my telescope, watching for tanks, whatever, military stuff, when there was this... It rattled all the windows. I, I, I don't know what it was. Perhaps a tank fired its cannon. I continued, scanning the face of the hill. Most of the streets were running with water. For the first time in months, the houses were recognizable. I saw what I thought was an installation and focused. 
I saw a telephone pole. I saw a child hanging among the wires. My husband's gone. What? And he's taken our son. When? Yesterday, last night. I'm not sure exactly. Okay. What's the name? Oh, no. No. I, I can't. I can't just do that. I, I can't betray my husband. Well, what do you expect me to do? Oh. All right, this last tape... This is the last one he did? That I can find. Mm-hmm. Well, hmm. did you check the hospitals? Yeah, none of the kids got that sort of wound. Stigmata. They call it stigmata. Stigmata? You know what I think? I think these tapes are fiction. Well, mutilations aren't. Well, I know it. Well, at least they've stopped. For now... I talked with Ling. Yeah? I mean, we need ideas. So what do you have to say? Well, he feels that the criminal will turn upon himself. What? No, oh, that's right. Self-mutilation. Now, the inevitable progression of the messianic personality as the disorder becomes more chronic. <laughs> Jesus. Well, that could make me a suspect. Sure. Uh, <laughs> relax. What now? We wait. There's nothing we can do. Not much. Unless you can stop the snow. Mm. Okay. Let's hear that last bit again. All right. Here you go. Okay, here he goes. Hmm. Entry 21. Now listen. The snow. The snow is falling steadily. Yet the sun is strong enough to cast light on the floor. A rectangle with bars. I can hear her singing above the noise of the vacuum. is waiting there still, a mutilator, of flesh, or only of the imagination. He will reveal himself, or the snow will retreat far enough to reveal the infinitely small place he has carved out of the winter, the vanishing point. Snow Shadow Area by Lawrence Russell. Starring Stephen Bush as the man. Robin Craig was heard as the wife and Chance Drury as the son. With Geza Kovacs and Bob Naismith as the detective and the prosecutor. Casting consultant was Catherine Kester. Recording engineer was Brian Pape with sound effects by Jean Sarrazin. And the production assistant was Peggy Esty. Original music was composed and performed by Timothy Clark. The series script editor is Sandra Rabinovich. The series' musical theme is by John Roby, and the voice of Vanishing Point is David Calderisi. Snow Shadow Area was produced and directed at Studio G in Toronto by series executive producer William Lane. Until next week, I'm Chris Henry, wishing you...